Hello, my name is uh, Paul Swain and welcome to today's sermon. Last week was Pentecost and all over the world the church celebrated its birthday as it were and the receiving of the Holy Spirit. Pentecost is in fact a Greek word meaning 50 days as in the required date measured out towards a celebration and a feast. But the original believers and the Bible were in fact Hebrew and that date and celebration of Pentecost is actually the Feast of Weeks which we can read about in Leviticus 23 verses 15 to 22 and Deuteronomy 16 verses 9 to 12. The Feast and Celebration of Weeks is in fact a celebration of the fullness and completion of the harvest the count begins on Resurrection Sunday, that is, the Feast of First Fruits, which in modern Christian times now goes by the name Easter Sunday. And it counts from there 50 days, which is where we get the name Pentecost. But it also has another measurement, that is, of seven Sabbaths, which is also seven full weeks. Seven times seven. Sound familiar? It should. Seven is God's number and it stands for completion. This is where we get the title, the Feast of Weeks, which in the original Hebrew is the Feast of Shavuot. So, on the very same day that the Christian church celebrates Pentecost, the Jewish nation celebrates Shavuot. This should not be a surprise, but it probably is to some, that the only division between Jew and Christian is the acceptance of Jesus Christ as their true awaited for Messiah of promise. And therefore those still denying him also forfeit the new covenant, the only atonement that will suffice which comes by way of the acceptable blood of Jesus Christ. So, in this manner we can see that there are two brothers. This also is a constant theme in the Bible, which anyone who loves the word will recognise. Jacob, that is Israel, prophesied the two when he prophesied over Joseph's sons, Manasseh and Ephraim. Manasseh was the elder son. And Jacob said he would be a great nation. Ephraim, he said, would be many nations. And you can check this out in Genesis chapter 48. Jesus also spoke of two flocks in John 10 verses 14 to 16. I am the good shepherd and I know my sheep and I am known by my own. As the father knows me. Even so, I know the Father, and I lay down my life for the sheep, and other sheep I have, which are not of this fold. Them also I must bring, and they will hear my voice, and there will be one flock and one shepherd. So there you have it. Jesus also says that there will be two flocks, but he will bring the two together as one do you ever wonder who the brothers were in the parable of the prodigal son? Yes, they were Judah and Israel, but they are also Ephraim and Manasseh. Even so, we do not forget Cain and Abel, Ishmael and Isaac, Esau and Jacob. The quest for the blessing of life and the jealousy of their rivalry. Praise the Lord that Jesus has come to unite us, even as it is the will of the Father. Psalm 133 Behold how good and how pleasant it is for brethren to dwell together in unity. It is like the precious oil upon the head, running down on the beard, the beard of Aaron, running down on the edge of his garments. It is like the dew of Hermon descending upon the mountains of Zion, 
for there the Lord commanded the blessing life forevermore. The Apostle Paul explained in the book of Romans through chapters 9 to 11 that the Jews of Israel were not to be considered cut off forever and certainly not replaced with favour or rivalry but for the sake of the Gentile world the gospel of Jesus Christ Yeshua Messiah was taken to us by their very feet that is of Jewish believers and I would further say that I believe that there has never been a time where there was not a great many Jewish believers of Jesus in this world. The tragedy of the Jews is when they are blind to their Old Testament scripture because they reject the message of Messiah as revealed in the New Testament. Jesus Yeshua who is the King. Likewise, the tragedy of the Christians is when they fail to comprehend the fullness and purpose of Jesus Christ in their New Testament because they remove and discard the Old Testament, which is the only journey and context in which the New Testament can be fully understood. If the Jew was jealous of the Gentile, who received by grace what they strived for with many labours, then so also can the immature Christian be no less jealous of the history, heritage and favour given by God to Israel and the sons of Abraham. The truth is, all who would be God's children suffer in this fallen world. Israel has, for the promise of God, suffered many great persecutions and genocides. Even so, all true believers of Jesus Christ have their blood shed unnumbered. I believe that those who seek and can hear God's voice have also heard him say, Children, brothers, make peace. Isaiah 9 verses 18 to 21 says this for wickedness burns as the fire it shall devour the briars and the fawns and kindle in the thickets of the forest they shall mount up like rising smoke through the wrath of the lord of hosts the land is burned up and the people shall be as fuel for the fire no man shall spare his brother and he shall snatch on the right hand and be hungry he shall devour on the left hand and not be satisfied every man shall eat the flesh of his own arm Manasseh shall devour Ephraim and Ephraim Manasseh together they shall be against Judah for all this his anger is not turned away but his hand is stretched out still if you have struggled to follow that, then I shall explain what I see. The wickedness of God's people here comes by the rivalries and jealousies of brothers that promote strife and the curse. The briars and the fawns are plantings remaining under the curse. To snatch from the right hand suggests to take what the Lord gives in the wrong manner. Just as to eat from the left is to take the lesser offering. The two arms belong to one body and now they are named Manasseh, the Hebrew followers of Jesus and the first church, Ephraim, the Gentile followers of Jesus and Judah, the faithful remnant of the covenant nation. Because they fight each other, they show that they do not know the father's heart. And so the father continues to discipline them. Perhaps you read it differently. But either way it is obvious that they are all the children of Israel. And as such those who God gathers and sifts to select his chosen. How good and how pleasant it is for brothers to dwell together in unity. 
If you really study what is happening in the book of Acts, you will see for yourself that this squabble between these brothers is real and it has lasted nearly 2,000 years to date. Yet I believe that we are arriving at a new state of harmony as the harvest ripens. Yes, this is a journey of transformation and it is all about the Lord's harvest. Therefore, because it has been a very long journey, I have gone to length to explain where we are in it with the full comprehension of the harvest history so that when I show you the nearness of its final end and gathering in, you may believe it and make haste in your own preparedness and your own gathering labours. Jesus is the Lord of the harvest and speaking to his disciples about his return and the end of the harvest, which will end when he arrives, Jesus gave the sign of the fig which represents the nation of Israel. This we can read in Matthew 24, verses 32 to 33. Now learn this from the fig tree. When its branch has already become tender and puts forth leaves, you know summer is near. So you also, when you see these things, all these things, know that it is near and at the doors. And in Matthew 10, verses 21 to 23. Now brother will deliver up brother to death and father his child. And children will rise up against parents and cause them to be put to death. And you will be hated by all for my name's sake. But he who endures to the end will be saved. When they persecute you in this city, flee to another. For assuredly I say to you, you will not have gone through the cities of Israel before the Son of Man comes. Again, trying to determine where we are in the harvest, that last verse is a telling one. For as the followers of Jesus are called to be a witness on the earth and evangelists, so also it could also be implying here that there is a retreat towards the safety within Israel. But that also would imply that the followers and worshippers of Yahweh and Yeshua find within the physical Israel a place of sanctuary. Either way, it speaks of a revival of faith in Jesus Christ in the land of Israel before his return at the end of the harvest. When I went to Israel a few years ago, and for the very second time, having been 20 or more years previous, it was amazing to see the difference of increased anticipation for Messiah. Moreover, the spread of the gospel of Jesus Christ amongst the Jews is remarkable. In fact, I found that it was irrefutable to my eyes and ears not to accept that God's eye was now firmly fixed on that final harvest. This does not mean that the Gentiles are no longer being saved, for they are indeed being saved. But it is a mark of the final harvest and of the end of the age. Jesus explained these final days in Matthew 24. Luke's gospel also recorded in chapter 21. And in Luke's account at verse 24, we read that Jerusalem will be trampled underfoot until the times of the Gentiles are fulfilled. Well, in 1948, Israel returned. And in 1967, so did Jerusalem return to them, firmly closing the period of time known as the time of the Gentiles. 2,000 years of Jewish diaspora have been the mark of that age. And the prophet Hosea foretold of it in Hosea 6 verses 1 to 2. Where it says that for two days we were stricken and on the third day he will revive us. Yes, this parallels and speaks of the death and resurrection of Jesus Christ, which it is. 
but it is also being laid out in the context of what God is saying to the nation of Israel. For we see following on in verse 4 that both Ephraim and Judah are mentioned for a context and God makes no mistake with his word. The Apostle Paul, the Apostle Peter, who is often seen as the head of the church, appointed by Jesus, tells us in 2 Peter 3 verse 8, that a thousand years is as a day, and a day is a thousand years to the Lord. And Peter said this in regard to understanding the times, the harvest, and the end of the age. So, by this measure we can determine that the 2,000 years of diaspora are also the two days of strife spoken of by the prophet Hosea as well. This is the end of an age and the end of the harvest where we see the Lord of the harvest return. We should be prepared and we should be excited. But who has fallen asleep? I see a revival and faith for Yeshua Messiah, Jesus Christ growing in Israel. And I see Gentile Christian brothers also excitedly awake with them. And they are all together of one accord, expectant with joy. Who could have foreseen this great day of brotherly unity? How good and how pleasant it is for brothers to dwell together in unity. This is the work of the good shepherd to make his two flocks one at the end of harvest. So, now we return to the sign of the fig. The fig is Israel, the long-term collective name for God's chosen people. Though for a time it had covered the historic northern kingdom when it was separate from Judah in the past. As I read it in the scriptures, it appears that God changes these names to denote the specific people and time that he is referring to. Therefore, God uses the same four names through his prophets in a consistent manner, where Manasseh, Ephraim and Judah have been specific terms of reference to specific encounters within God's covenants. And all they have been begotten by Israel, the collective name of the one nation and quest to be a people in God by covenant. The fig is Israel and it is always speaking about Israel's fruitfulness and harvest. In Matthew 24, Mark 13 and Luke 21, we read the same parable of the fig tree and in all these instants and account they are they are the same and the time of speaking appears to be when Jesus was heading up to Jerusalem to make the ultimate sacrifice and atonement this is important to understand because upon the same journey it appears that Jesus has another two references to the fig that are very revealing. In Mark 11 verse 12 to 14, Jesus curses a fig tree that doesn't bear fruit. Later, in verse 20 to 26 of the same chapter, Jesus explains from the fig concepts of faith, forgiveness and reconciliation. Interestingly, these two separate interactions with fig trees in Mark chapter 11 sandwich between them the very event of Jesus cleansing the temple. This point is very important as we come to our final fig tree story and the main purpose for our journeying today. In Luke 19 verse 1 to 10 we can read the story of Zacchaeus. Zacchaeus was a Jewish tax collector in the town of Jericho when Jesus was passing through it. More than likely also on that journey 
towards Jerusalem. Zacchaeus wanted to see who Jesus was, so he climbed up into a sycamore fig tree in order to see over the crowd. Jesus is aware of Zacchaeus and calls him to come down out of the tree. And as they meet together in Zacchaeus' house, Zacchaeus repents before Jesus and Jesus declares salvation over Zacchaeus. Now, I have given you a shortened version so that I can now move on to the deeper picture references here. The name Zacchaeus is a variant of the name Zachariah. Zachariah means remember Yahweh or remember Yah is pure. Broken down the Hebrew meanings, Zakar means to remember, Zakak means to be pure and Zakar means to be clear. So from this we can see that Zacchaeus is a variant of Zachariah which means remember Yah is pure. However Zacchaeus uniquely means simply remember to be pure. Remember to be pure. When you understand this and then you see how Jesus plucks Zacchaeus out of the fig tree like a harvested fruit in this encounter. Then following on how Jesus exclaims the redeemed Zacchaeus that he also is a child of Abraham. Then you can be sure that Jesus is talking to us all as Israel. How different this is from the barren fig tree we see in Mark 11 which had no fruit and was cursed by Jesus before he cleansed the temple. So with contrast we have two encounters with a fig tree. One has no fruit and is cursed. The other if you like has fruit shaken out of it. The sycamore fig tree in which Zacchaeus was plucked for salvation was also known to the ancient Egyptians as their own tree of life. And in the land of Egypt, these trees were all destroyed by God in the plagues of Egypt that he sent to release his people, Israel. How interesting it is then that Jesus was on his way to Jerusalem where he would hang on the cross, our true tree of life. That on his way he plucks Zacchaeus out an eternal illustration of harvest fruit. And here he sends a practical message to all the church. Remember to be pure. Just as further on and near to Jerusalem, he curses the fruitless tree, even as he cleanses the temple. Friends, Zacchaeus repented. Indeed, he was happy to repent. We must relearn. That is, we must remember that if we are the body of Christ, the church and the chosen, if we are to be saved and chosen on that day of reaping, we must be ripe. We must be repented. For when the Lord of the harvest arrives, there will be no more time, no more harvest. What is repentant and ripe will be plucked and gathered in. And what is unrepentant will be left on the tree of curse. We must learn and remember to be pure like Zacchaeus. For afterwards many will long to repent eternally. But will not be able to do so. This also to the believer is the severe comprehension that it is joy now for us to be repented in the Lord and greater joy for that redemption. In this world we can see that there is hatred, division and even race wars. Even so, quietly 
those with eyes and ears to see and hear, both Jew and Gentile are turning, repented towards God through Jesus Christ and joyfully united in this repentance, they are excitedly ready, ripe for the reaping and looking forward to it. The harvest is nearly over. The feast is about to begin. Repent, get ready, put on your garments of ripeness. Remember righteousness. Light the oil lamp of the Holy Spirit. Bride, your groom is near, even at the door. Repent, repent. Happiness and joy abound in those repentant ready and ripe with forgiveness all who hear and are called arise and wake up before it is too late for behold he comes quickly the harvest closes the trees are shaken at the last and only the ripe fruit will be gathered in i hear the pleasant and good sound of brothers united. I see crowns like confetti being cast down before the King of Kings. Are you repented? Are you ripe? Today, this day, even now, are you ready?